Welcome everybody to uh, today's session of uh, DOTS. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Joseph Pat. Joseph is an assistant professor uh, at the University of British Columbia uh, in the Souther School of Business, um, where he also has a, an associate appointment in the computer science department. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc at ETH in Zurich, um, working with uh, Robert Weissmantel, um, and he, before that, received his PhD in applied math and statistics at uh, Johns Hopkins University with uh, Amitabh Basu. Uh, and Joseph's interests are in discrete optimization um, uh, and, and geometry. Um, and today he's going to tell us a bit about uh, those kinds of topics, but also an advertisement. Um, so, Joe, please take it away. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elias. And thanks, Alex, as well, for the, the invitation to come speak. So before I jump into the talk, I'd like to advertise the MIP 2023 workshop. So in case uh, this is unfamiliar to you, uh, every year there's this mixed integer programming workshop, which just has everything uh, mixed integer programming related at it. It's a wonderful single stream workshop. It's geared towards, again, all aspects of MIP, but it's also geared towards students and postdocs. So uh, if you fit into one of those categories, I, I highly suggest you attend. Um, on top of that, this year, for the second year in a row, we're going to have a computational competition. Uh, I point you to the, the website for all the details. So this year's topic is going to be on reoptimization. So in this competition, if you have ideas from say machine learning or some other stand, some other maybe more classic IP tools, uh, it would be helpful if you could, uh, well, the community would appreciate it if you could use those tools to design better reoptimization techniques. So that's the whole point of the competition here. Okay. Um, one last thing, the, the finalists in the competition, we're expecting to provide them with financial support to attend the conference so here's a little bit of incentive to join. Okay, I'd be happy to talk more about this afterwards if anyone has questions. All right, so let me get into the talk. Um, today's talk is gonna be a combination of a few different projects. So these projects are done in part with many different people who, are, who I'd like to thank. So, so John Lee, who's at Michigan, uh, Ingo Stauknecht, who is at ETH Zurich, uh, Zach Walsh, who is uh, at Georgia Tech, and Lou Sadzu, who I believe was in the audience. Uh, he's at he's now at UC Davis as a postdoc. So, so what I'm going to talk about today, as the title suggests, is something called the column number of a delta modular matrix. Uh, I, I don't expect anyone to know what any of these words mean at the moment, that's my goal. Uh, so along the way, if you have any questions about anything, please let me know and I'll try my best to clarify. So <clears throat> to, get us, to get us started, I'd like to just define what a delta modular matrix is. This is gonna be the, the fundamental object that we play with today. So uh, for us, we're only gonna be considering integer valued matrices. And uh, our matrix is going to be very short and very long, if you want to think of it this way. And we say that uh, the matrix is delta modular if all of the square submatrices have a determinant that's bounded by delta. So definitions are always hard to, to kind of grasp. So let's see some examples. So here I've got three different matrices. They're all, again, short and long, so they have rank two. And in this first matrix, if you take any two columns uh, and you take their determinant, maybe these two and these two, any two you get, uh, you get a determinant that is an absolute value at most one. So no matter what submatrix you take here, you get a determinant of zero or one. So this is a one modular matrix. Um, the 
second matrix, notice that here I do have these two columns, which give me a determinant of two in absolute value. And I think that this is best possible, uh, biggest possible. So for this matrix, we say it's two modular. And for this last matrix, I think if you take these two columns, you get a determinant of nine. And so this last matrix is nine modular. Okay. Uh, before we go on, are there any questions on the definition of delta modularity? Okay. So uh, in some sense, delta modularity measures complexity of a matrix. Uh, and it turns out that it comes up as well in integer programming. So a big open question right now in the field of IP is the following. If I give you a, an IP and the constraint matrix has bounded determinants, then can you solve this IP in polynomial time? So if, if I cross this out, um, then we know that this question is, is NP hard. So really part of the integer programming field is to, to add extra assumptions that make it more tractable. And one might ask, what happens if we bound the determinants? And this question has been studied in some forms for a long, long time. So, for simple case or simple for small cases of for small values of delta, uh, for example, if delta is one, then the integer program has what's called a totally unimodular constraint matrix, and the IP becomes an LP, which we can solve in polynomial time. Uh, just in, just recently, people showed that um, if the determinant is bounded by at most two, then again, you can solve the IP in polynomial time. And there are a handful of other scattered results, like if the matrix has a general determinant, but the number of entries, the number of non-zero entries in each constraint is at most two. Okay, constraint or, or column. But beyond these sort of scattered results, no one really knows, no one knows if this question is true, if the answer is yes for delta uh, bigger than or equal to three. And so to attack this, this conjecture, one somewhat natural question is, uh, can you study basic properties of delta modular matrices? So presumably, if the answer to this question is yes, then one would have to exploit some nice structural properties of these matrices. And that's really the, the jumping off point for the talk today. So you can be very creative and think of many different properties that one might be interested in, but Perhaps one of the simplest properties of a matrix is how many distinct columns it can have. Okay. And this is the second part of our talk or the second part of the title. It's this thing called the column number of the matrix. So to, to define the column number, I need to define what it means for two columns to be different or differ. And so for our purposes, we say that two columns are different or they differ if they're not equal to each other and they're not equal to negatives of each other. Okay, so for example, in this middle matrix, um, all of the columns are different under this definition. In this third matrix, all of the columns are again different. Uh, but in this first column, notice that, or sorry, in this, in this first matrix, notice that I have these two columns, which are negatives of each other, 
And so when, when we count different columns, we, we ignore one of these two things. Okay. Um, and for, for reasons that I won't get into now, uh, we also ignore the all zero column because it only adds at most one to what we're gonna do at the end of the day. So again, with our examples, uh, we had a one modular, a two modular, and a nine modular matrix. And uh, each one has different numbers of differing columns. And the question that we're interested in is the following. For a fixed rank and a fixed determinant, how many non-zero differing columns can a rank M delta modular matrix have? Whew. So this is a mouthful. Uh, again, sort of the idea is if I fix the rank and I tell you that uh, for this fixed rank M, I would like a a one modular matrix or a TU matrix. And I'd like it to have as many columns as possible uh, without breaking the, the TU structure. How many columns can you have without starting to repeat columns over and over? Uh, any questions here? Um, so I have maybe a quick one on the slide before that. Yep. Um, so, uh, this is the the open question has to do with fixed parameter tractability. So is then um, a positive answer to your to your question would would imply that there exists an algorithm which uh, runs in time polynomial in um, everything uh, except the the delta, right? So it can be exponential in delta, but has to be polynomial. Um, in everything else. Correct. So the algorithm has to exploit knowledge of that parameter to somehow solve the problem efficiently. And that's how you're getting around the NP hardness of the general case, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Some sort of fixed and, parameter tractability is what we're hoping for. Okay. And then I'm waiting to see how you're going to relate the two questions in those slides to, to one another. They're somehow uh, related, right? Yes, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, in this talk, we're not gonna, we don't have so much time to get into the, the details of the algorithms, but um, I'm glad you asked this, Elias, because the next question is why do we care about the column number? Um, and so what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on, perhaps most of my talk actually, is just trying to motivate we're trying to, to discuss with all of you some different areas in integer programming where this column number comes up. Um, and we're not gonna, we sort of full disclosure in this talk, we're not going to answer that question in the affirmative, but we'll see that there are many other concepts that are more algorithmic in nature, uh, and we're going to show how the column number can be used to to uh, how it how it is used in those concepts. So, for example, we're going to be looking at uh, something called proximity, something called test sets or Graver bases or Hilbert bases, if you're familiar with these. And I, I don't think time permits, so I'm going to skip this last one. But it turns out that you can also use the column number to bound what's called the mixed integer relaxation. Essentially, what this is is that you can use the column number plot. To, you can use the column number to reformulate an integer program so that it's a mixed integer program, and the number of integer variables only depends on the column number. Um, and Depending on depending on some other things, you can be clever with this this relaxation. And here, you can use uh, Lenstra's algorithm, say, to derive algorithms that run in in this amount of time, which is independent of n, 
uh, but it depends on the column number. But I can chat more about that offline if anyone is interested. Okay, so why do we care about the column number? Uh, first, I want to discuss a little bit about this thing called proximity. So the proximity question is as follows. Uh, suppose I give you this polytope P. So this thing here in blue is our polytope. And if I want to optimize over the integer points inside, say I want to maximize in this direction, C, then the red point is the point I really care about. But many algorithms will start off with the x star point, which is the optimal solution of the linear relaxation. Now, had I chosen a different direction, maybe I chose this direction here, then I get a different vertex. And I mean, not surprisingly, I get a different vertex and a different integer solution. But notice that in these two pictures, uh, the sort of in this picture on the left, the two points are close together, close in quotes. Whereas in the second example, the two points are farther apart. And the proximity question is just this. Can you give some a priori bound on how far away your optimal integer solution will be from your linear solution. Okay. So again, I give you uh, a polytope P. Can you give me some bound? And the way we've defined it, the bound is independent of the objective function. You look at all possible vertices, from those different vertices, you look at the closest integer point, and you'd like to bound that number. So this is the proximity question here. Um, Elias, to your and, question, and and sorry, can I can I ask you a follow up uh, quickly? So that uh, closest integer point. Will it also be the, the optimal integer one for any objective function uh, for which the corresponding vertex is the LP optimum? Um, so you can restate the question in that way. And it turns out that, at least to my knowledge, all of the, all of the proximity bounds do prove this. So they prove that. Okay. If I give you a polytope and an objective, mm -hmm. this X star depends on the objective and the Z star also depends on the objective and they both gotcha. maximize the objective. Okay. So, so all everything I talk about will also hold if you think of optimal solutions. Awesome, thanks. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. Um, so to the, the previous question of how does this tie in algorithmically? Well, proximity in a sense is a, it's a, a measure of closeness. So you can use this not surprisingly to derive what I'm going to call local search algorithms. Uh, they're related to dynamic programs. And so proximity has come up quite a bit. Uh, in the IP literature, I only cite two very recent results here. Okay. So proximity is its own thing. We could talk about this for days, but the title of this talk is the column number. And it turns out that you can bound proximity in terms of the rank of your matrix, the determinant, and this column number. Uh, at this point in time, it's not clear what this bound means. There's nothing to contextualize this bound with anything else. So I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. 
once we've discussed some actual bounds for the column number. But this just goes to show you that you can use the column number uh, in other areas of integer programming. So here we're looking at another structural result uh, dealing with proximity. Okay. So I'd like to give, I'd like to pivot and talk about one other application of this column number. And it comes up in the area of test sets. So test sets um, are also called, if you're familiar with graver bases or augmentation algorithms, this is what I mean by test set. And I think for this, it's best to see it with an example. So let's consider this graph here on the left. And let's try to solve a max ST flow problem on this graph. Now, many times it's easiest just to see this in terms of the graph. But as many of us know, we can also phrase this as an integer program like so. So we have flow conservation constraints and the flow value has to be non-negative and uh, satisfy some capacity constraints. So how does the, how do many flow algorithms work? Well, we start with a feasible solution, which is often no flow. You start with nothing. And we see that here on the graph. And in terms of the integer program, that means our initial solution is zero. We have nothing. So how does the flow algorithm proceed? We push flow along some path from S to T. And in terms of the integer program, that corresponds to adding some vector H1 to our current solution to get to a better solution, X2. And the flow algorithm repeats this. We push more flow from S to T. And uh, in the integer programming world, what that means is I add another vector, H2, to my current solution to come up with an even better solution. And this continues until I arrive at a best solution. Now, again, I acknowledge that the, the network picture is perhaps the more natural picture for the flow problem. But I wrote down the integer programming steps because it turns out that for generic matrices A, integer valued matrices, they don't have to correspond to the flow problem. It turns out that you can still use a, a special set of test vectors and use these in an augmentation algorithm like we do on the right. Okay, so again, whereas the left is perhaps more natural for flows, the right can be generalized to general matrices. Um, we just have to find the correct test vectors. And again, these are called graver bases. It's not so important for formal definitions here. Uh, and these graver bases, these augmentation algorithms have been studied for a long, long time. Um, but in terms of column number, it turns out that you can bound, you can essentially bound how many test vectors you will need using, again, the rank, the determinant, and the column number. So again, the column number comes up as a bound, a, a bound that often is seen in these, uh, these augmentation algorithms. Okay. Okay. So let's finally get to some results. Uh, <clears throat> what do people know about the column number? Well, uh, for totally unimodular matrices, this question has completely been solved by Heller in the 50s. And since then, I only list two bounds here. Since then, for generic delta, uh, people have come up with bounds that are uh, not polynomial in 
delta, but they're polynomial in M. So glands are at all prove that this column number is upper bounded by the rank squared times this delta term. And Gielen et al. prove something a little bit uh, different. They showed that you can separate the quadratic dependence on M from everything else, but the everything else has a very nasty dependence on delta. And so our main result is that you can uh, bound the column number as a polynomial in both the rank and the determinant. Um, since our result came out, uh, there was another team, Averkov and Shimura, who proved another incomparable bound, but it's also polynomial in M and delta. So I'm not going to prove how we do this, but I'd like to go back to these proximity questions and the test set question and show how our result plugs in. So the best known proximity results were, one was by Cook et al, which depends on uh, the, the rank, the determinant, and N, which is the number of columns, not distinct, just number of columns. Uh, and in 2018, Eisenbrand and Weismantel proved a bound that's independent of N, but it has this somewhat undesirable exponential dependence on M. And so using our results, you can again push all of these numbers down to be polynomial in the rank and delta. Okay. And the same phenomenon happens with, uh, with these graver bases test sets. So again, the, the best known bound was sort of M to the M times delta, and we're able to push that down to M cubed times delta cubed. Uh, so so I, I don't have time to go into the proofs of these. They're quite interesting, but as a last comment, I just want to mention that uh, this is work sort of in, in another line of work that's about to be submitted to the archive. Uh, it turns out that you can identify what are called forbidden minors uh, or forbidden matrices and use ideas from matroid theory to really leverage some, some nice matroid theoretic tools and come up with uh, not only more bounds, but it will also, these, these minors help you understand the structure of delta modular matrices what can and not can what can and cannot exist, and then uh, hopefully those things can be used to uh, generate some algorithms for optimization or recognition things like this. And this is done with Ingo, Zach, and okay. Um, so sorry if you were expecting a proof. Uh, we did not go over any today. But just as a conclusion, again, I'd like to say that um, this column number is a very simple structural property of the delta modular matrix. But even though it's simple, it does tie into some more well-studied properties like proximity and test sets that do have uh, connections to the algorithmic side, which is the ultimate goal at the end of the day. And then what we were able to do is we were able to derive the first bounds that are polynomial in the rank and delta. And we hope that this line of work can help us better understand sort of the overall structure of these matrices uh, for the algorithmic side. So I'll stop there and just say thank you all. Great. Thank you very much. Um... Joe, so uh, we can, I think we have time maybe for one question. Yeah, Alex. Um, so if you have a question, please feel free to raise your, your, raise your hand um, or type it in the chat. Um, or feel free to save it for the breakout rooms after. Or save it for after, yes. Any questions?
Okay, all the questions are going to be um, for the for the breakout rooms. Okay, so um, so thank you again, uh, Joe, for the very nice talk.